Hey everyone, can you hear me? I think you can, you should be able to. Let me go ahead and just double check everything. Okay, awesome. All right. Uh, make sure if you have any questions, just preload them into the chat and we'll go ahead and get that all um, taken care of. But for the most part, I'm just going to get some stuff ready and, uh, yeah, talk about the game, talk about where we're at, you know, and uh, what's been going on. One second. Um, this is going to just be a short stream. You know, we're just talking about um, everything. Like I said, you can either drop your questions on Backer Kit uh, during the live Q&A, which I'll be looking at. Or you can drop your questions in the Twitch chat. Um, either or is fine. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we're just going to be going over the game, talking about some art and stuff, and um, just generally going over the vibes of the book uh, and kind of explaining things. And some of the unforeseen concepts that we haven't really talked about. So it should be interesting. Okay. All right, that should be good. Okay. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, I'm Nicholas Francia, Nick, you know, whatever you want to call me. Um, I am the uh, lead designer of Eldritch Automata. Uh, we are in the middle of a heat wave here, so I apologize for my shiny and spectacular demeanor today. Um, and I also work in AV uh, and technology, so... The outage uh, that I'm sure you've been hearing about for all your IT friends and AV related friends, it's been wild for us. But uh, the good news is, you know, it, it gave me a lot of time today just to uh, work on some stuff and, you know, some stuff we get to talk about today. So very thankful for that. Um, so first off, I want to say just kind of like how we talked in the update, I want to say a big thanks to uh, everyone that has backed us so far or has shared or supported us in any way. Um, You've truly been amazing. Uh, we've hit over 100,000. We're at 109,000. And I never thought in uh, any of my wildest dreams that we were to get there. When we originally launched in January, we were at 65K was our goal. We only made about a little under 40. Um, and so that was a big blow for us. And we've talked about this quite a bit. We came back. We got to lower our margins. And uh, from there... We kind of did a little bit of a reset, took everything back in, and now we uh, relaunched and it's been uh, an amazing success. So uh, to me, the kind of reception, and, and I've said this in the little Instagram reel I put out um, the other day and on, on uh, Twitter, that the uh, it's just super overwhelming. It's, it's amazing in the best ways that we can kind of just go and like talk about this and you know, people want to see the project uh, and people want to play the game, um, which is awesome. Because, I mean, like, as a creator, that's really all you want to happen. Um, and thanks, Rax. I appreciate that. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a little I, I did my crying. I cried when we hit the 65K and I cried even more when we hit 100K. Um, and it truly is an amazing feeling as someone who's like, you know, I'm a designer. I started this so many years ago, back in 2017. And to ever think that it would get this far that, you know, when I, when I designed it, I never thought I'd be able to publish it like I am now. And, um, with the funding we have, you know, enough to first off to fully realize the book we wanted to. And I, and I really want to talk about how, like, when we set our original goal, we had to make a lot of compromises um in stuff that we could do and then couldn't do and stuff that was going to get left on the cutting room floor um we originally weren't going to ship with the deluxe edition we weren't going to uh ship with the modules because it was just too much you know too much for printing and and whatnot uh if we just hit 10k it would have been like a very limited run until we were able to do a bigger run um but now we can do everything properly we can launch the full extent of our plans and then some um You've given us, you know, funding to start our second book. And uh, something I always talk about is that I didn't want this to be a single one and done book. I always wanted this game to be a game line. I'm going to adjust so it picks me up. But I always wanted it to be um, 
a game line. I didn't want people to play my game and be like, wow, you know, are there any other supplements? And there was none. And because that's happened to me a lot where I play some cool games and we never really get to see a second product. And, you know, that's it's disappointing. And sometimes that's the reality of what the industry is and um, with how the margins are and everything. But uh, with proper planning, we were able to you've you've made this. This is going to be a game line now. You know, we have at least two more books that are that we're planning alongside it. Um, so just to let you know, that is going to be Homefront, which is going to be the fourth source, the first source book, um, which is going to focus on non-automata combat and civilians. So it's going to play out like a more traditional, um, like horror game where, as you know, it's, it's a bunch of you fighting one horror and by fighting, you're like very tactically trying to injure it or, you know, either kill it or run away. Um. And that's going to be led, of course, by myself, but also that's going to be more of Ian's uh, wheelhouse because that's always was his his uh, his dream for the first supplement for the book. So I'm very excited to allow him to take the reins on that. Well, I get to work on our campaign book. Um, I, you know, I won't even reveal too much of it yet because this is something that it's going to go in development after everything is said and done. But I have the out my, the first book I always wanted to release. Um, was this campaign book that this is going to be uh, the full campaign that someone can can run start to finish uh, a full adventure that would hopefully take a good amount of sessions. Uh, I've always been a fan of multi-year long campaigns. I haven't been able to be in a multi-year long campaign where there'll be a mech technical manual. Um, can you elaborate on what a mech technical manual? What do you mean? Because that kind of sounds like the core rule book. Will there be an automata technical manual? I guess I'm I'm just wondering what, what that would entitle. So if you're talking about will there be more archetypes? Is that what you're saying? More automata archetypes? Oh, did not mean to do that. Sorry, a little alert popped up. Um I also don't want to worry worry about the blue screen of death. Hopefully that doesn't hit this computer. Um but yeah, the the thing that I was also developing, you know, Dark Passenger was a con scenario that I wrote. Um not originally very hastily for the first ever uh the four man ta the the four tables at Pax U, the original year we were starting to promote it um and that was done in about a month or two and then i went back and i really tightened up dark passenger uh for um for the actual quick launch and i kind of added stuff we got to make art for it i tightened up made it more of a longer length and it really came to its own um but I really wanted to show because I feel like, you know, one shots, not that they're easy to to write, but they're a lot easier to write than, say, a campaign and keep the flow going. And one of my big things was like, all right, well, you have these giant robots. How do you stretch that out into a campaign? And that's what this hopefully this next book in the game line is going to be all about. Um, maybe like old school battle tech manuals like the 1980s style. Ooh, I'll have to check it out. Like a like a bit of a like a bit of a fictional, like in-game fictional thing. Um let me see if I can find it out. Has it signed up to create a tech players wanting to engage? Da -da -da -da, fusion rant, da -da -da. The modern battle takes the end result of more than three thousand years. Um Oh, so if you want to do automata via automata? Is that what you're talking about? You can, I mean, you could do automata via automata now. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the, there's going to be automata lore in the core rulebook. I think we're, we're getting that stuff, uh, already. I mean, that's all going to be in the core rulebook. You're going to get automata via automata. Um, there's going to be some scenarios for that. There are some enemy stat blocks if you want to run rogue automata or just. I mean, that's something that's kind of included in there. And then, I mean, like, in terms of lore, you are going to get a breakdown of all the lore. Like, I, I want to say, like, uh, I want to say the kind of, uh, between the book, the kind of, um, like, 50% mechanics and then 50% all the lore. Because this game does have a deep amount of lore. Um, and some of that I'll actually go through with, you know, today. I will, we'll talk about that. But, I mean, if that's something that people want to do, like a, like a collectible, like a little, like, handheld, like, you know, your guide to Tom. I, I don't know how that would look. I mean, that would be pretty cool, though. That's not a bad idea. 
Um, I almost like the idea of it being like very like haphazardly like sketched, like like a pilot guide that like pilots do. But if you're if it's more of like, oh, here is a condensed rule book to play the game, like a player's guide. I mean, we have the quick launch for that already. Um, that teaches you how to play the game and everything. The only thing that doesn't include is building your characters and um, which is obviously a big chunk of it, and then all the armory up and systems as well as some of the diseases in game, just because that's some some of the more denser stuff um, that you don't necessarily need that I wanted to save for the core rulebook. Have you done a lot of Automata versus Automata combat tests? Yes, and funny enough, uh, not on purpose. So we have run some like one-shots and even extended scenarios where uh, you were fighting against other Automatas, and I mean, those are just like enemy stat blocks that are designed like horrors and anything else, so just with different flavors. Um, and then we just got it, and then also, like, it devolved into PvP uh, quite a bit in some of the tests. Um, you know, there was a lot, someone goes berserk, all right, they're putting everyone in danger, what do you do? You gotta put the automata down, and then that ends up being this, like, chaotic thing. So we have definitely already, yeah, we've already seen that, um, funny enough, without even trying. Um, and it's a lot of fun. It's very destructive, very mutually assured destruction. Um, berserking usually... But that power, that power gap that you gain when you berserk usually doesn't end well for the defenders. But I assume the berserk mechanics pushes PvP scenarios a bit, which I love. Yeah, so uh, it does to a certain point because obviously, like berserking is like slay your enemy, and it's. Um, but sometimes you don't, you know. There's a lot of the like the kind of things that we put a roadblock or like, okay, well, what happens? You know, whenever a Thomas fight, there's always a collateral, and it's like what ends up happening. Uh, when you like are fighting in a big city, you just like knock everything over, you destroy things, um, you put people in danger, and then what happens when you get the order to retreat and you're berserking? Well, you don't, you know, you don't listen to those orders. Um, and then there's also the fact, okay, what happens when they're the enemies are still around and they're and they're still berserking? Well, then you turn to the player and you're like, well, you know, they could be seen as the enemy to you, so go ahead and go wild. Uh, it doesn't always end in PvP scenarios. If you don't want that to be a thing, um, Berserking doesn't have to end in PvP scenarios. But if that's something your table is good with, uh, have at it. You know, that's amazing. <laughs> Berserking is probably one of my is 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 one of my favorite concepts to put to the game because it it means that when a you know when a character hits zero, they're not down and out. Um, but it also is like a hell of a a hell of a cost. And and not necessarily just in like the whole like oh we'll destroy it well to the character itself when you berserk, you know you're gonna lose stability that's gonna lead closer to breakdown your breakdown is arguably more detrimental to your character than your berserk, um, I mean some automatas like the beast can voluntarily go into their breakdown or into their berserk, and that's wild. So, and that was kind of like to emulate a lot of my. Uh, you know, a lot of our favorite inspirations. Like, I always love the Berserk modes in Evangelion. Um, even in Gundam, when, like, a character gets, like, very highly emotional. Um, and they're able to push their, like, mechs to the limit. I mean, that that's what it is. It's it's breaking those limits uh, beyond all personal safety. And and some Automata can do it better than others. I mean, we've all seen the archetypes now. So you've seen, like, stuff like the Strainer or the Overload. And, I mean, when they go Berserk, it's... A little more destructive, uh, a little more, you know, collateral damage. Oh, of course, the collateral as well. Um, uh, but for them, it's it's more kind of in their base kit. Like the overload has a has a nuclear reactor built into it, and when they berserk, they go into meltdown. Um, and pretty much, you put a timer on your. You're like, all right, I got to finish the fight, or I'm gonna blow up. I will be definitely running a PvP Atomata tournament at some point. Armor Core's ruined me. Yeah, uh, I bought Armor Core to do research. I was like, hey, this to me is important. Um, Armor Core, I will say, Armor Core is, you know, probably not the way I designed this game, which Armor Core has that really cool, like, gameplay loop of, like, take on a challenge, realize what you need to have, switch out your parts, take on the challenge, switch out your parts until you find the right build, where there's not a lot of switching out of parts on Automata. It's not like, say, something like Lancer, where, you you know, you can, like, you know, put multiple equipment on and stuff like that. Like, sure, you can switch out your weapons in here and there, but it's not like you're switching, like, left arm, right arm, left leg, right leg, with different legs, and they each have different stats. Uh. <laughs> but also, I feel like there's a lot of mech games that do that really well, and uh, the nice thing that EA has is that it's very easy to get into. The talents make it so there is a very high, like, 
ceiling to go for in terms of combos. Um, I think we were doing this before, like the amount of technically the amount of um, variations you can get. So now we have 13. So with with 13 uh, pilot archetypes and 13 Tomlin archetypes, that means you have a combination of 169. Now, those are six talents. Each has six talents. So and you only get two to start out with. And then, you know, you can pick from any of those talents. So you figure if you want to do really rough math, that probably isn't right. Um, so you have 169 total combinations. Each one of the um, the automata and each one of the uh, pilot archetypes have six talents. So that's a total of 156 talents between both pilots and automata. And you times that by the amount of combinations you can have. So yeah, you can technically, with talents and all, you can have over 20,000 different combinations, um, which is a hell of a way to do it. I'll say that's it's a hell of a way, you know, obviously a, a lot of the combinations are like minor variations. Oh man. And then you get the tags and the tags are going to be something. So yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be wild. Um, you know, I, I don't want to like put the emphasis to be like, oh, well, no automata, no one automata will be the same because obviously some combos are going to be found better than others and some people are going to make similar automatas. But what I will say is you have a, a, a very fun toolbox to use around and kind of make wh whatever you want to do. Um, and I think that's pretty cool. Uh, in terms of the tag system, the tag system's great. Uh, I really, honestly, that was uh, inspired by a lot of like when I played like uh, Big Eyes, Small Mouth um, and like Tristat where you kind of built your attacks with like, ta with like not tags, but you built them with like pros and uh, cons. And I really like those are advantages and disadvantages. And so I kind of took that, distillated it, made it a little bit of a different balancing system. Um, and I really like tried to bring it to life, trying to cut down the redundancy. And that's kind of where the, the tag system for the weapon armory kind of came about. Um, so that was really cool to do and kind of get that all, uh, together. And, uh, something else I was kind of inspired by was like almost like borderlands where you have like over 10,000 different guns because, you know, they're just either randomly generated in some of the later games, or you just have every variation you can. Um, so no weapon that that's the one thing that no weapon will probably, you know, if you're not, if you're, everyone's making their weapons from the ground up, uh, you'll probably have a lot of different weapons. No weapon's going to feel exactly the same. Uh, and of course it's also how you flavor it. I mean, building a, you know, a thermal spear versus building, um, a sword versus building a lightsaber, you know, might have very similar tags, but, uh, just be flavored very differently in the narrative of things. And that's something I think Year Zero does really well. It's like, okay, where well, you have this part mechanics, you have the part story that you're telling, and the mechanics never really get in the way of uh, the narrative. They, they go hand in hand, and I and I really like that. I really enjoy that. But, yeah, 169 base. Yeah, it's crazy. Nice. <laughs> and then that kind of gets to my next thing. Cause someone, so someone was asking me earlier before, like, um, so what are your plans to add new archetypes to the game? And my answer to that was really like, I probably in the future, definitely in the future, maybe like one or two, but with 13 or 13, like that's a lot of classes. How many games do you know ship with 13 classes? You know, <laughs> that, that to me, I was like, even when I originally was like cutting back, I was like, Oh, am I making too many? Should I keep this to like a base eight and eight? And I was like, no, no, no. Let me just go with the 12 and 12. Why, what, why would I gatekeep my original, like my original 12? Um, and, and it's a lot. And I feel like you can do a lot within those 13 archetypes, uh, for pilot and 13 archetypes for automata. And there's just like so much work you can do in there. Um, Slyfner says, I feel like there's so much work to do at new automata and necessarily pilots to make them feel fully unique instead of amalgam of others. Yeah. And that's something that we kind of like when we approach design, it's like, all right, well, can this be done in another, like in the same archetype with different fluff and like some of the archetypes can, you know, not that they feel like that, but they can already are kind of like closing up to each other in identity, like the heavy and the collateral, um, to me feel very similar in the same themes of destruction, but that with the heavy is what I wanted to emphasize is you have this very slow walking, like tank, like, automata um where the collateral was not about being slow and heavily armored it was just not giving a shit and having explosions 
and doing like environmental damage. So to me, that's where the identities differed enough where I could have those two, even though they kind of rub up against each other. And that's the same with the overload where the overload is very like explosive and it's, you know, in its negatives and in terms of like it explodes. But overall, that was more about controlling your heat and controlling your, your inner energy rather than using environments or being heavily defended and just being a walking fortress. So they do feel different. And, and like in terms of like what new automatas can go for, I, I'd really need to think about it. And it would really need to be a good idea, especially for the pilot archetypes. I never want to release just a, an automata archetype should always be released with a pilot archetype because I always want to keep that even. That's like that symmetry is what we need uh, across the board. So, you know, there probably are more pilot archetypes. There's a lot of pilot archetypes I, you know, left off the table. Um, the Forgotten is a very unique one. And so is the Eldritch. And that's kind of like why they were left out of the initial draft, even though, you know, there was rough frameworks for them already. Um, is there a way to play as unpiloted people? Like recovering teams, like when I pilot burns out, the mech is still valuable. So that will be cut. So by base, you could just play. Uh, there is a little section about, well, what if I don't want to use an automata archetype? Um, then you can just play the game with the pilot archetype. Obviously, you're going to be a lot weaker. Your stats will be as half as good as a pilot, but you can do that. And that's like our simple way of playing like just like a like a, a normal character. But Homefront, which is the first best view. I don't know what that is. I think that is. I, I think that I let me see if I can. Uh, I don't like that. I don't know if that's a. Do we have any mods in here? Can we get rid of that? Can I get rid of that? That's a bot. I, of course, I don't have mod powers right now. Or do I? Do I? Yeah. Let's see. We're gonna. We're gonna. We're gonna time you out, Bert. We're gonna time you out for ten minutes and see what happens. Goodbye. Thank you. Time for six hundred seconds. Have a good day. Um. But yeah, so home home part is going to be more talking about uh, playing as the civilians, the cleanup crews, the bounty hunters, um, the people that scavenge and take automata parts to sell on the black market, as well as horror part uh, parts of horrors, which is very dangerous because horror toxicosis is a thing, and uh, yeah, that shit will infect you. So don't do that. Um, I would I would definitely that is a very dangerous life. But yes. That is coming. It's got a simple version of it right now in the core rulebook, but it's going to have a more expanded one with Homefront, which is going to be talking about that, um, being as a civilian. And I don't want to give away stuff because like it's still all in concept and testing, but there are some really awesome things there um, that Ian has come up with that I've you know lent a few ideas myself, and I can't wait to to show them off. And honestly. I'll probably feel ready to show them off once we have like art for that down the road. Uh, but we want to finish the core rule book first. That's like our first and foremost thing. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Could you have a campaign though where it starts with civilians eventually discovering a Tomata pilot? Yes. Yes, very much yes. So, so this was one of the uh, first ideas that we did throw around. So originally in the concept of EA, the like original story that kind of started off was a person finding what was considered like the first automata. Um, so you, you could do that. Yes. Uh, and then one of the campaigns, we actually had one of our characters who was playing the other, um, and they played an automata that had the ancient archetype. And, you know, for the first couple sessions, they didn't have uh, a robot. And then they found it at the end of the third session. It was this really awesome thing. So yeah, you can totally do that. Like finding some old war machines. Oh Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that that might be something to uh, that might be something coming in a campaign book. You know, we have some ideas. Um, I will say the campaign that I was writing uh, dealt a lot with uh, themes of isolation. It was very heavily inspired by Annihilation. So, yeah, if you ever watched that movie, good movie. You should watch it. One of my, one of my favorite inspiration. Honestly, a great inspiration for a home front campaign. <laughs> Let me tell you. Okay, just checking things here and there. All right, awesome. Ayo! Great movie. It is an amazing movie. Man, I yeah. Good, yeah, Screaming Bear. Uh, that was one of the inspirations for the horrors. Uh, what movie? Annihilation. Uh, it is by Alex Garland. Alex Garland has directed some of my favorite movies, which is Annihilation and Ex Machina. He also just did that movie Civil War, which I haven't gotten to watch, but I'm very interested in seeing it. Um, 
sorry, Natalie Portman. Uh, all women cast, they're amazing. Uh, and they really bring it together. So great movie. Going to need to bring out all my t- big ass tier and minis. Yes. Oh my God. Chris, Chris Hanley, who's writing our, um, edge of apocalypse, uh, who is like a war game expert. So doing the war game of, uh, uh, Eldritch Tomata, uh, has put together some awesome roles and the great thing about it. And one of the big worries that I brought that I was like, all right, I need to sit Chris down and we need to talk about this is like, I don't want a war game where it's like, you know, 30 V 30 Automata, because to me, you know, at most a nation has like single digits levels of Automata because they're just big ass. Like how many skyscraper ass mechs can you have in the apocalypse? Like how many can you put together? And and you're kind of waiting for the automatas to get destroyed so you can scrap them for metal and reuse that in building other automata. Um, and then when I came to Chris, Chris had already been like, all right, here's my vision. You know, you get like three to four automata uh, flanked by um, army of like supporting units fighting its horrors, one seraph. And I was like, beautiful. You've already hit everything. Um, like you've already hit kind of the themes that I was thinking of. Oh, I am looking at something, right? Oh, nothing. Cool. I'm getting into the breach vibe. Yeah, very much so. I like, um, into the breach was, are you talking about that specific rim, right? Oh no, the video game into the breach. Oh, I've never played this. Oh, I love this. It reminds me of like a, like advanced, like, um, super robot wars. I love super robot. Yeah, this is cool. I love games like these. I love TT, um, TRPGs. I almost said TTRPGs. I'm like, wait. I love TRPGs. Um, they're great. I love Advance Wars. I love Fire Emblem. Um, my original TRPG was Shining Force. And yeah, I love Super Robot Wars. Yeah, I really like FTL. I've never I've beaten FTL, FTL once. I've never been able to beat that twice. Um, very tough game. Do they gather uh, horror bodies or parts? That's something about the Eldritch. Uh, that's where the Eldritch lies. Um, normally you want to quarantine and you want to burn horror parts so that they don't give off toxicosis. You want to dispose of them. Um, you, that's putting them onto your robot is a very, very horrible idea that a, a certain group of people have decided they want to test the boundaries of that. And that's where you have, uh, essentially have the Eldritch with some other stuff. Um, the Eldritch also gets to resurrect a really cool idea that I had wanted originally for the automata, but it just didn't work. Um, and that was the idea of organic cockpits. So think about that for science. That's all about. Right. Yes. Uh, we're going to be doing an update about the uh, antagonist groups that will ship with the cool rule book as well. Um, so, you know, th- the horrors are bad guys. The seraphs are bad guys, but uh as always in any situation where someone stands to gain something, um, humans are just as bad sometimes. And the antagonist groups are all focused around the human, the humanity and how they treated, uh, Advent day and the resulting, uh, war and chaos. So you get to learn about one government, the chimera group, uh, as well as a couple more for when you need a question. Are there any factions in games that create one particular automata or pilot archetype or another, such as the manufactured, the mass produced or the other? Um, so yes and no, uh, we don't like, so the Eldritch is very much, the new one is very much a chimera group automata. That does not mean you have to every Eldritch needs to be a, a chimera group, but just, that's the original. That's where they found it. Um, that's kind of their bread and butter. I would also say the Chimera Group and one government employ mass produced a lot of times because if you need like an army, uh, a small bat- you know, a battalion, you and you need to fill it fast. That's what you use. Um, but I like to think that everything starts as the mass produced and then eventually builds up. So it's like, all right, yeah, you get the default like kind of template. Um, and then it's kind of what you put on there that makes it different. Um, but I will say like something like the ancient you would probably see more of in the order of uh, anathema the chimera group would have um something like the prototypes or even the eldritch or the mass produced one government would have the mass produced and would probably um the manufactured so the manufactured okay this is really cool because this is something we didn't get to really talk about in the backer kit um this is something that's in the core rule book um the manufactured are essentially 
uh like biologically like test tube pilots you know they are they're synthetics they are um replicants whatever you want the androids to be at that point um and their idea was like well if we make these disposable pilots uh you know we don't have to worry about human con you know human lives being lost but in order to interface with the automata you know a, it, a being needs to have ego so it's like okay we need to give these you know clones egos these replicants egos these synthetics egos and well, well what is ego it's a sense of self so we have to give them sentience essentially and now as a manufacturer you play as it's like okay well i am like i recognize myself as a person but i'm being told i'm a machine and i have coding and everything else and and you're kind of striding that line like am i a machine am i just a weapon or am i my own human being that deserves you know the same amount of uh life and rights and it, it's it's kind of wild in that because like when humanity is often shown when pushed the edge you know we'll we'll do great things but we'll also do horrible things and you know creating uh people you know beings just to die and be cannon fodder for the automata might not be the the bet you know that might not be the most morally right idea in this scenario also if you're going to vilify an entire new creation of, of beings, why would you give them this, you know, put them all in super powered mechs when they could easily turn on you? You know, it's all very flawed process. Am I just the ghost in the shell? Or am I still a person? Yes. Perfect. And I mean, even any, any normal human pilot can go through that. When you hit zero ego, you lose your sense of self. You are basically like, I am a part of the automata and the automata is I, um, and there's even diseases and like for that that we have in game that reflect like overexposure to the ego of the automata um and that's something we also get to get lore wise into the ego chamber which is going to be in our automata uh focus chapter of the book um where you get to read kind of all the juicy lore about that and the uh the creation the inner workings of the automata why why they need to look the way they look what their blueprints are based off of yeah it's a lot of existentialism can one automata become another through gameplay so yes and no that's a that's a very good question rex so mechanically wise um you can use your experience to buy a lot of things including extra talents you can buy talents from other archetypes um that is something that you are allowed to do now that being said it is more expensive it costs more experience points to pull talents from other archetypes that are not your own um so while you'll still be the same that original archetype you started as um you could become a cool amalgamation of two like and, and there's going to be limits to that though like like in terms of like what a talent you can take first so obviously like if you're if you're taking a talent like the stealth or taking a, ta a tomato talent from like the stealth you you're going to need to want to you're going to need to take like the required one first which is unseen predator which is the thing that gives you the stealth ability in the first place because all their talents um, are linked to that first ability so that's the only thing that if they have a required ability that needs to be the first talent you take from them before you can take any other talent but yes you can do amalgamations of things like that finally i can play as dr krieger from marcher yes including your um holographic wife um am i just uh oh, i read that who doesn't like existentialism in a post-apocalypse where i feel like that's the perfect thing you're left all alone you don't have really a lot of modern media you just have a lot of propaganda and radio so what else do you do but contemplate your life and why you keep fighting Genlock. Genlock goes. I haven't watched Genlock. I've heard a lot of good things about that. Are there other mega project level constructs like super heavy tanks and stuff like that? Or is an entire military uh industrial complex dead and locked into just mechs? So it's not like that they're dead and locked into just mechs. It's just most of their resources are going into the automata. And the automata have the ability to produce ego fields, which they haven't really been able to reproduce in other inventions just yet. It's it's a very funny thing because it's not like they're making these mechs because they want to. They're making the mechs because they have to, and they have to design them in these in these particular like boundaries of ways in order for them to work because they will not work otherwise. Uh, and that's something we kind of go into the book, and that's something that's a little bit of a mystery, and and that's kind of connected to the grand like architect of things. But yeah, there's a lot of yeah the Pegasus, the flying air fortress. Um, there's plenty of like stat blocks for um like a battalion of tanks other weapons like there's still other military weapons there and and like military constructs and whatnot but nothing on the level of the automata 
that can produce ego is what I would say. You have like rail guns and like nuclear weapons still. Um, but ego fields, they're wild. Wow, you need to watch the first episodes. Oh, not for, oh yeah. Oh yeah, Rooster Teeth goes. Oh, it was on Rooster Teeth? Okay, I didn't realize that. I always thought it was a Cartoon Network thing. Maybe I'm thinking about like Generator Rex or something like that. So, and, and that's kind of something that I always like, uh, I was trying to stress too is that we this is also post-apocalyptic so we you know a lot of the nations have kind of like so a single nation has basically retreated into a, uh a, the death of like one or two cities and it's basically like all right we're putting all our survivors here because a lot of people have died like up to 90 percent of the world is gone which still leaves you know a little over you know a little over a little under a billion people but now everyone is coalescing into these like kind of mega cities where they're just armoring themselves or they're going underground um in terms of like the reform kit the the reformed kingdom which is what the british isles became where they all just decided hey it worked for us during world war ii we're just gonna go underground and stay down there um i'm just picturing a tank division the hunts and tank Tunnel. funny enough we were just talking about this where someone was asking me well, well can there be a stat block for like a tank or like you know a uh and I said there would be there are stat blocks for a battalion of tanks that can do minor damage to a Tomina if it rolls high enough, but um, one tank would not be able to take on Tomina. Like I'm, you gotta imagine like a Tomina is 80 meters tall. Have you ever watched Pacific Rim? Um, that's how big they are. And and we showed I showed off this picture um, to scale. I don't know if I could put, I can't really put it on here, but to give you the the size of of scale when talking about these things um so the ava units in the new uh new evangelion series like the rebuilds they're 40 meters so they're half the size of the Tamana. mecha godzilla is 50 meters tall so not optimus prime is 23 meters tall um a voltron is 60 meters tall and then Gypsy Danger from Pacific Rim, which is, you know, we based the Automata off the, the the stats and size of of the Jaegers, because we were like, that's a great one-to-one -one that we like. That's 80 meters tall, which is 260 feet tall, which is, I don't think they have the weight on here. I really wish they would, um, but I can't even imagine. Oh, so a six-foot, 160-pound man, a large to the size of Gypsy Danger, which the Jaeger would weigh 12.7 million pounds. That's, okay, th those are definitely some fantasy numbers, obviously, but, yes, they are very big. Big creatures, big boys. Um, and we love them for that. <laughs> and thanks for everyone for coming in. I'm still reading questions, but I just want to say, hey, thank you all. Um, that's one, yeah, it's huge. Um, and that's why whenever that's why I talk about whenever they fight in a city, like you can put, you know, every time an automata steps on a street, it's gonna crack the street. If an automata falls into a building, they're gonna break the building out. That's why you're allowed to bring down skyscrapers on things and like bust through them. Um, it'd be really wild if like this battalion were to find a way to get high off a of horror blood. Oh, like oh, I'm already thinking of Mad Max, allowing for some of the psychosis to take them over. Um, so yeah, I mean, eventually you turn into a horror. I, that would be horrible, but yeah. Um, the order anthem uh, 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 anathema. I might have some thoughts about that. You know, you'd be you might be a cool pilot for the Chimera group. Who knows? I jokingly thought about a pilot archetype that was just a horror, um, but I didn't like it because it's like there's no way to like you would just be completely PvP, and we already have some like more PvP focused archetypes, which are not PvP in the way of like I'm gonna like hurt all my friends and make sure they die, but like, well. I, I can lead people to bad situations and that'll give me bonuses. Like, that's what I want to do. So, like, stuff like that. There's, like, the hatred is very much like that. Um, I wonder if a swarm of human-sized horrors could overrun an automata. Yeah, it isn't possible. I mean, even human-sized horror, uh, they have very small ego fields. But, yeah, I you know, they could. It's a bad thing. It's very possible. Might be an enemy. Might consider it. I mean, if a swarm, also a swarm of human-sized horrors could just combine together and their ego fields and make a very powerful um, horror. What if 12,000 crows took on Godzilla? Yeah. Well, I, I even think about, like, 
like it's almost like destroy oh my god this destroya when it like started as like all the little guys and then they all combined together to make destroya and that was like the one creature that's ever i know he lost the guy or, or they lost to godzilla but like godzilla still died because of it so mm, crabs yes i love godzilla give me the end of shiny uh shin godzilla tiny little horrors yeah that's a there are some um there are some uh enemies like that uh our writer for the class the, did a whole classification of horrors that was uh connery um and they made some awesome ones including uh one called the full variant which is kind of what you're thinking of um which are people that have just recently been overtaken by horror toxicosis um and horror toxicosis for those that don't know is a disease you get from standing near a horror it's it's like a psychological reality warping disease because the horrors are just so wrong so what ends up happening is they just warp uh they just warp warp and warp until your body can't take it no more and you just succumb to it and you become a horror um which is kind of like that husk that we talk about you know you lose your your soul you your husk gets transformed yeah it's it's i think it's still better than what happens with the seraph which is um when the seraphs hit you they hit you with uh seraph radiation um which will enthrall you so not only do you get you don't get to die you get to serve the the seraph and whatever uh conniving fucked up way operation that they have and that's a really cool thing like the horrors just want to eat and consume and like they they have a pretty one note um the seraphs those are the ones that are like you have to watch out for because not while all their goals usually end in the detriment of humanity um it's not always as forward as like destroy all automata. So they all have like an operation or a goal they have in mind. They all are an aspect of the architect. Uh, and in that case, actually, what would be really cool one? I think I'm going to do that. Oh man, I really should have got water for putting on this, but we're almost done. This was only going for an hour. And I just wanted to answer a few questions and talk and give updates. Um, angels to the left of me, hearts to the right. And here I am starving in the massive city. Oh, here I am, starving in the massive city. Stuck in the automata with you. Oh, 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 oh. Stuck in the robot with you. <laughs> and I'm wondering... I'm trying to do the lyric. And I'm wondering, what else should I do? It's so hard to keep the smile from my face losing control. Yeah, I'm all over the place. Yeah, well, that fits. I'm just going to say that. Um, So what's the next update? Uh, The next update we're going to talk about antagonist groups. Um... You know, then comes the waiting game. We're already getting the pledge manager fixed up. We got to wait for the funds to clear before we can commission all the art. And let me tell you, we have been waiting so patiently. Uh, we are getting our editors in line to start reviewing the stuff that we have so far. Um, and then we're just collecting the rest of our drafts, putting it all together. Uh, and then we're going to get our content editor to go through and make sure that it like flows all correctly. Uh, so it reads like a, you know, a full book and not just like this separated piece of poop uh stuck in the robot view i may have gotten here late but that's more shippy than i expected <laughs> uh gen gen con yes uh hey hey k hey nice tv thank you for subscribing i appreciate you um so yeah gen con so we're gonna be at gen con we have a shit ton of games i believe like 36 games are running um and they are all sold out so if you got into an ea game congratulations and thank you for making ea huge i mean we ran from having 12 games not even 12 we ran from having eight games at pax u um which they all sold out too to having 36 at gen con to hopefully having uh close to double that at pax uh at this pax u ea game challenge everything yeah challenge everything it's okay come to pax u and then not only that you get to see me at the booth uh, I don't know if any of you saw me at the booth of last packs where when I was talking about this game and being really excited. Um, I'll sound just like this until about Saturday, uh, which is usually because I do karaoke and then I'm going to lose my voice. And then I'm going to sign very raspy, but I'm, I'm still going to be wanting to talk to people. Um, I always love talking about this game. I always love hearing people's opinions about it. I remember someone came up and was like, hey, I don't think they knew I was the creator, but they're like, hey, I just want to say EA was like one of the funnest games we played. And I was like, I almost cried. It was great. I didn't come to Gen Con uh, or Pax you a mild case of wrong continent, but have fun. Aw. 
I'm sorry. I I I don't know where about what continent you're located. I I've talked about wanting to go to UK Games Games Fest um a lot because I think that'd be really interesting. And I do want to make it out to PAX uh, Australia one day. I think that would be interesting. I also have some friends in Australia that I would love to see and hang out with. Um, and also I just like traveling. Um, and if teach RPGs let me do that, who knows? Um, but. Yeah, so like the the thing is now that we're gonna do is just you know now now comes all the fun managing part. Uh, the good news is that Ian is kind of is my project manager, um, is my partner in all this, and he's the one that that's what he does best. So he's got the pledge managers fixed up. Uh, I am working on getting the content, the rest of the stuff we need for the book, as well as uh, I got our art profiles together. Working with Geo, Geo's putting the last finishing touches. Uh, I believe Geo is oh, there is yeah they're over halfway. Um, with all the automata archetypes done, well now they got to do another one in the Eldritch, so that should be fun. Uh, we keep we keep giving more work. Uh, for invisible pulls, have you ever considered an automata that relied less on their own sheer strength but relied more on the Mestro network or something? Uh, so that's something like the Legion that we have. So the Legion is uh, has the hive mind kind of mechanic, where they're one master unit and they have a little bit of all these little like small units um, that they have, and that is very much their power comes in being tactically all everywhere uh versus their own sheer strength and that's really cool because you can they're they're more of a, um, a support unit because all their abilities rely like the abilities that have lock on um and can help their allies you know actually hit targets they can you know be everywhere else they can pose the disadvantages across the field um so that's definitely one of the more mechanical ones uh funny enough the junkers also ends up being very supporty as well so we do have a lot of like of course the ones that you want to show off at first are going to be the ones that are like all up in your face the very bombastic ones but there are a lot of like more subdued ones i mean the ancient actually has uh has a heal like a healing um basically like a healing spell um in our in our form the junker is low-key one of my fa uh one of my faves yeah I love the Junker. Oh, who doesn't want to play piece the with the back pedal legs, the digit trade like uh, digit trade legs? Is that how you call it? say that? Um, and that was very heavily inspired for like uh from what is it? Uh, I'm trying to think what the it's Chernal Alpha, Chernal Alpha from uh, Pacific Rim. Uh, it's like I know it was Cherno something. Hide your Balo or Fur Lancer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we have a we do have like a Legion. There is an archetype called the Legion that does exactly that. Uh, invisible poles. So, like, yeah, going through all this, it's it's just been a crazy ride, and I've just been super appreciative uh, for everyone that's helped support it. Um, what I'm, I guess, what I'm most excited about showing off is a lot of the lore aspects because it, it it's we give the baseline, but uh, we don't really get to kind of dive into it. So, really quick before we end, and I'll. Yeah, digit digrade. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit of the lore bible. This has been heavily, heavily expanded on, but the lore bible was like the first thing that I started on. Um, and for those that don't know, a lore bible is basically my version of a story bible. For those that don't know what a story bible is, uh, a story bible is something that they make for uh television shows, which is and in movies as well, mainly for TVs. I've seen a lot of them. You can actually look online if you look up like a story bible, you can probably find um a bunch of like shows that have ones available stranger things has a very good uh story bible that usually is very uh regularly um available and it's funny because it actually shows you yeah it's basically a world building guide um and it shows you the original uh title for stranger Things, which is called uh montauk and it's cool because uh usually when they make a story about it's just like a bunch of Im it's always like a bunch of images from other uh other movies and like other media that's like okay here's the vibe we're going for um so you can see like that the, they're in their case their vibe is very much like fire starter uh mixed with stand by me mix of altered states mixed with a little bit of jaws and then like kind of when you see it you're like oh i can see the identity yeah authors do it too yeah i mean not for anything like i feel like fire and blood from a song of fire and ice or even the the original the world building book that george R. R. martin built that was basically his story bible um if you want a good story about from a book that wasn't finished, The Last Tycoon from F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, shows what a lot of um, his himself and his wife's 
you know, his wife was one of the primary authors and might be even more so than him himself. Um, for a lot of his tales, you can see a lot of the like story concepts for what would be his last novel. Um, and it's a really good novel to read if you want to be a writer. Uh, so going in, I want to read it. Let me talk about the manufactured. Okay. So I'm going to read this word for word. Uh, give me a real story. Yeah. Give me a real story, Bob, that's just Avon Dan the Architect. Yeah. I mean, there, there was an original novel. There was a couple chapters. There's a good outline of that. Um, that ended with a horror being in the moon. I don't know if that'll ever return, but we'll say, uh, gold fleck pages and all great novella. So the manufacturer and manifestation of human ingenuity and mechanical marvel in the world of Eldritch Automata crafted with meticulous attempts to detail these androids stand as potential replacements for human pilots with a natural ability to pilot automata to their maximum efficiency with an appearance almost indistinguishable from humans. The manufactured are sleek and refined that hide their intricate internal mechanisms, bioorganic and grown in test tubes. They are the latest innovation spurred in the wake of the architect. What sets the manufactured as a powerful resource is their ability to directly interface with an automata, sparing human lives. Through a blend of advanced neural interfaces and enigmatic technologies. Talk about a word I can write, but I cannot read well. Uh, enigma enig enigmatic. There we go. The manufactured can channel their artificial will into the heart of the automata. And I see artificial will in quotes because it's just will at that point. It's probably just as good as our will. Uh, into the heart of an automata, forging an intimate link. The ethics of treating the manufacturer as tools have been wildly up for debate as some manufacturer design with more human like personalities and some more obviously AI. Uh, we have one manufacturer that we ran our test test game. That was basically like a floating drone. They were also the operations admin. So they were literally the ship. Uh, what constitutes a spark of consciousness? How does it compare to their human counterparts? The ethical dilemma surrounding the emerging technologies of the manufactured cast a shadow of uncertainty around their existence causing the survivors of this new world to grapple with the implications of their actions. Um, Critical K asks, what exactly comes in a $55 pledge? I'm so glad you asked. We can talk about this right now. Uh, no, thank you. So, so for a $55 pledge, you are going to get the hardcover edition of Eldritch Tomata. That is going to be the normal edition. That will not be the deluxe, but the that's still that beautiful thing, um, as well as you're going to get the PDF for free. You're going to get the Alchemy uh, Virtual Tabletop Edition for free. And you're going to get all stretch goals, physical and digital. So what does that mean, all stretch goals? So we look at all the stretch goals that we hit so far. Um, you also get the all digital rewards and all uh, the back work. So you get the first launch stuff. So you get the core rulebook, the first launch, which is the patch and the t-shirt, um, which is that first launch patch. And then the first launch t-shirt and then you're going to get uh the alchemy btt edition so you're going to get the game on alchemy if you want to run that virtual tabletop and then the stretch goals we have just to get over all the stretch goals that we hit because there's a lot of them thanks y'all um the forge module is going to be included in the core rule book so that's coming come in the core rule book the pegasus module is going to be included in the core rule book that's in the core rule book you will not unlock the Seraph edition because that is the deluxe edition and you have to uh, upgrade to the Seraph tier or buy it as an extra add-on. Um, you get the uh, Alchemy Enhanced. So you are already getting the Alchemy VTT, which is going to be like the, the more standard form of that. But the Enhanced means that we get to actually make like really cool um, animations and little macros and like animated virus, motion effects, ambient sound, all that great stuff that kind of like they they uplift to make a really cool experience you're going to get the eldritch arms which is going to be in the book you're going to get the new recruits which is going to be um is going to be i believe that's going to be separate that's going to be a little folio that you get um and that's going to construct that's going to basically contain 24 brand new character sheets so you're just going to have a bunch of new like pre-gens to start out with uh, the Academy, that's going to be in the book, in the Coral book. So, yet again. Uh, guest Operation, that is going to be... Uh, so, that, we're going to see if we can fit in the Coral rule book. Uh, that might be just a digital-only release as a PDF we give out to people, just because I don't want to limit um, Austin, who's writing that. Uh, all this, you know, that could be in the Coral rule book, but more than likely not, it's going to be a PDF. 
because I don't want to limit them to the amount of pages they want to write for that. Um, Homefront, you're going to get a PDF copy of Homefront when that releases. Uh, Homefront isn't going to come out until and isn't going to go into development until after Ultra Automata has, sh has has shipped. So EA Homefront is is, is going to be is you know it could could not be we could be on a quick turnaround, but uh, EA Homefront is going to be probably a couple years out, um, at least one or two. You know, if we could finish and ship it by the end of 2025, that would be wild. And I'm talking about Homefront. We we plan our our soft plan is to ship uh, EA, the actual core rulebook, by quarter one, 2025. Um, if we would have hit our goal back in January, we would have been able to release at the end of the year. But now, you know, we got to make sure. We want to take our time with it. Um, but you're going to still get it in under a year is is my is is de my uh, my want, because I want you to be able to play this game as soon as possible. Um, you're going to get the guest operation for uh, No Quest for the Wicked. Um, that's going to be something as well. Same as the guest operation. You'll probably get it as a PDF uh, if we could get it into the core role, if we can. Um, but we do have a hardcore page limit. We don't want to release a 600-page tome. And I worry about releasing that. But you're going to get that regardless. Uh, you're going to get Edge of the Apocalypse, um, which is going to get you complete rules for an Eldritch Automata War game. So you're going to get the PDF for that. Um as well as the STL files. Now, people are asking, what are STL files? So those are like 3D model files that you can actually 3D print, and then you can have the little models if you want to play the particular automata. Um, it's because we don't have the really the ability to produce a bunch of miniatures and like sell them in the prepackaged. Like that would be cool, maybe down the line. Um, but for now, you're gonna get the the STL, so you can do it yourself. Um, you get the two new archetypes. That's gonna be included in the core rulebook. Uh, you're also going to get the uh, official soundtrack. So if you uh, get a physical version, if you get the the uh, if you get the physical tier, which is the fifty five dollar tier, um, you're going to get a little cool USB with the soundtrack on it, as well as the digital download. Uh, we also are going to be selling vinyls as extra. And if we hit the one hundred twenty five k, you'll get the ST Forge campaign, which is going to be on the same kind of basis as Homefront, which you'll get it as a PDF rather than uh, a physical. Um, but you'll be able to buy the physical uh, additionally if you want to do that. So yeah, that's everything you get in a $55 pledge. Um, the Storyteller Forge campaign isn't a guarantee. We would have to hit 125. We are a little over 15,000 away though. So with six days left, anything's possible. Under 15,000 away. All right. I talked a lot for an hour. Um, I'm going to start wrapping up here. Is there any last... Uh, bit of questions that people have any questions at all i'll try to run through them rapid fire just start dropping them right now though Ugh, i should have brought water why didn't i do that but yeah and i mean that's a lot for 55 i uh i'm really glad that we were, we were able to give people a good deal a lot of value uh that's always my hope for this always have water yeah i I just got home like half an hour, well, half an hour before the stream started, so very much I was like, oh, I want to make sure, um, I want to make sure, like, I'm here on time for it, so. <laughs> but what happens for me? So, what's the next step for me? What am I going to be doing? I'm going to be writing. I'm going to be writing, and I'm going to be commissioning art, and I'm going to be talking to artists, and I'm going to be talking to writers. Uh, what Ian's going to be doing, Ian, Ian's going to be managing the funds, Ian's going to be do, uh, managing the pledges, going to be paying out people, whatnot, and, and you know, our almighty flowchart and getting shipping logistics ready. Um, the great thing is we already found someone to ship, we already found someone to print, so that's all a done deal. Um, and that's nice because we don't have to worry about that and we have the funding just to like give it over and get it go. Uh, give me more GM event to organize. Okay, cool. Uh, really quick. So... If you want to run games for us on Paxio, uh, please come to our Discord. There is on our website, Gahangian.com, there is a form to fill out um, that you can in order to become a GM for us. Um, it's a lot of fun. If you run um, as many games as there are days, so like for Paxio, that's three days for three games, you get a free badge. We give you a badge. That's our, you know, do you run three games for us? You get a free badge and you get to go. Um, something like, you know, like Gen Con or like, um, or like PAX East, like four days, 
okay, that you got to run four day, you got to run four games. So very simple, very simple trade off. Um, and then you get to enjoy the rest of the con. And then depending on like other stuff, we uh, sometimes have paid opportunities, which is really nice. We've been able to pay our GMs in the past um, with certain sponsorships, but that's kind of up in the air, whatever we get. I can't guarantee that, um, but that has been known to happen. So, and we've had it for the last couple of ones. So let's hope that trend continues. <coughs> All right. So that seems to be the end of it. Doesn't seem to be any more questions. Thank you everyone for coming in. Um, if you want to see me do more of these, please let me know. Um, Someone suggested if you like, sometimes I play video games on here. I mean, like, I can play like art. I like Dead by Daylight. I'll scream, but it'll be fun. The Eagles hat seems even hack. Yeah, man, I love my bird. Yes, go birds. Um, I'm Philadelphia native. Grew up here. Love it here. Um, Pax East is great for it. This actually has sand stained from the shore still. So, yeah, fly Eagles fly on the road to victory. I'm very excited. Yeah, and uh, I almost bought the uh, NCAA um, 25 college football game that just came out. I haven't played a college football game in like 10 years, guys. Or I, I haven't played a football game in like 10 years. What am I doing? Um, and then what am I doing right now? Well, I'm running an alien game in my, in my free time. Uh, I'm playing a lot of Eldritch Automata. I'm still reading a lot and testing a lot of rules. Uh, I'm watching as much mech anime as I can until I can't game anymore. I'm showing my partner Yu Hakusho. That's really cool. That's really fun to go through that. And I'm just generally excited for what comes next. It's it's such an awesome feeling that I have to thank you all for. You have given that to me. You have given me the ability to look forward and be like, anything we, is possible. Um, and anything and everything. And we will do anything and everything. So I really hope you stick with VA. I really hope you enjoy it. And let it be known, I hope to fill your entire shelf with just EA-related books and projects. Uh, that would be my dream. I, I want you to bring people over and be like, this is my EA shelf. This is where I put all of my EA gear. It's above the vampire shelf. Because the EA shelf is, is better than that. No, but, um, yeah, that would be great. I don't want to mean to be cocky. Uh, there's a lot of great mech games out there too and i really also want to do my super robot wars idea that would be awesome um which is getting all the mech creators together and just having like a combo book just for like guest starring uh but if you want to check out the cool mech games and you backed you should play uh lancer for sure i love lancer lancer is like it's not like the granddaddy but it's like the new age king of like mech games um beam saber an amazing forge in the dark mecha game uh and that was done by austin ramsey uh who is writing on the book their writings are amazing and they've done such a great job uh and i'm really excited to see not only the guest operation but the writing they're actually doing for the quarter book as well um uh, they're running on one government, so it's really awesome what we've seen there so far. And I also have to ha make sure that Ian reads their draft, so we can give uh, we can give them the approval on that, and just and and finally put it into the final manuscript. I run DNA ca campaign that's heading towards Mechers Kaiju, and then I saw your game. Perfect timing. They'll transition from five E to EA. That's wild. I want to hear about that. Please tell me more uh, whenever you get to that part. Run a re uh, write a recap, please. I would love to read that. Um, but other than that, everyone, uh, have a great day. Oh, other mech games. Sorry, I need to call up Battletech if you want some old school, the old school shit that's been around for a while. Battletech is great. Um, my first mech TTRPG I ever played was uh, Mech Warrior, which is amazing. is very very dense, but a lot of fun. Um, I have to t talk to the granddaddy of like the mech games that inspired me, which was Adeptus Evangelion. Hate, do not like Dark Heresy that much. Do not like the system. Love the identity for making me be able to play Evangelion uh, in a TTRPG and giving me the inspiration to make one too. Um, Gamma Wolves, two newer game you can use to win Gunpla. Yes. I never heard of Gamma Wolves. I'll have to, I'll have to take a look into it. Um, Tears of the Machine, a really great indie game uh, based around mechs. Um, there, uh, I have... Oh my god. My friend uh, Jax Brick uh, wrote a game called um, I Have No Railgun and I Must Scream. Uh, really good game about playing a relative that is waiting for their mech pilot to come home. Uh, I'll give them a shout out to there. They make really amazing LARPs and really amazing games. Uh, and you should check them out as well. Um, but other than that, have a have a great day. Oh, oh my god, I cannot believe I forgot Bliss Stage. Check out Bliss Stage. 
Blitz Stage is amazing. Um, that's very based on like Simpho Gears. And uh, that when I was first starting out Eldritch Automata, um, the creator of Blitz Stage was very uh, awesome and talked to me. And we like kind of got to like, uh, you know, trade some ideas around. They were one of the first people that I like talked to when I was first putting the idea together. Um, and we, you know, so it was really cool. And I actually met one of their friends at um, Pax Shum. They were really awesome as well. There's a lot of friendly faces at Pax Shio. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to get out of here and I'm going to get some water. Bye, everyone.